It was about a decade ago when I started realizing that some of my scientific discoveries could be applied in solving the problems of global warming. And this is something we're all very concerned about, and I believe that this is something we deeply care about, and that's why I know I'm in the right place talking to the right people. With all the efforts undertaken so far, we can still witness the steadily rising concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And many experts in global warming and climate change believe and agree that if we do not want to damage our Earth irreparably, we have to get the concentrations down to at least 350 parts per million. And currently, we are well above that. We are at 387 parts per million. Also, looking at the steadily rising concentrations, we might say that we're doing nothing about it. We all know that this is not true. We're doing a lot. I would rather rephrase it and say, perhaps we're not doing enough. Because I strongly believe that if we do not combine all our efforts globally and take into consideration all the possible options that could mitigate this problem, we might fail. Or we might end up doing something totally insane, such as shooting billions of tons of sulfuric acid into the stratosphere to cool the planet down for a short period of time. That is exactly what is going right now in Iceland. But I'm here to present to you a new solution that could significantly contribute to solving this particular problem. So what does it take to get there? Well, to get to 350 parts per million, we would have to reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions by 80%, plus remove and store 79 billion tons of carbon from the atmosphere into geological reservoirs. And this is a huge, huge job. And there are various approaches in progress worldwide. Uh, development of carbon capture and storage technologies, then technologies developed <coughs> to capture and utilize different forms of renewable energy, laws and regulations put in place to reduce emissions, then we have cap and trade system under the umbrella of Kyoto Protocol, and carbon sequestration technologies to remove carbon dioxide by increasing primary productivity. And primary productivity is a process whereby plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it along with the energy from the sun to increase in their numbers and biomass. So therefore, logically, by increasing plant biomass, we would have to decrease the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is exactly how the idea of iron fertilization of the oceans was born. Because in 1980s, scientists have discovered that vast regions of the world's oceans, including uh, southern oceans and equatorial Pacific, even though having very high concentrations of available nutrients for plant growth, lack primary productivity because they lack natural inputs of iron. And nature primarily seeds the oceans with iron through aerial fallout. And here you can see the example of Galapagos Islands in the equatorial Pacific, where the winds, which primarily blow from the mainland, pick up the particles with iron from the islands and deposit them into the surrounding oceans, inducing plant growth. And Martin and his colleagues in 1994 proved his iron hypothesis by fertilizing this small patch in these oceans of 68 square kilometers and managed to increase primary productivity three times in two weeks. And the idea was embraced as a blessing. Moreover, since the uh, southern oceans are the fourth largest ocean on the planet, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current has a water column of more than 4,000 meters. The region has the highest concentration of available nutrients for plant growth as compared to all the seas and oceans worldwide. And here you can see the spots where various scientific experiments have been conducted in order to prove that Fertilizing these regions with iron would induce phytoplankton blooms and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And they did it in these regions because this is the only natural system our planet has that is powerful enough to deal with so much carbon in the atmosphere. However, 
over time, iron fertilization of the oceans became a story predestined to be rejected, predestined to be refused, because previously conducted experiments did not prove any removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And some prominent scientists have written about it, like Sally Chisholm, Paul Volkovsky, and John Cullen, who claim that iron fertilization of the oceans will not work. And I couldn't agree more with them. Let me show you why. Phytoplankton are the base of all the food chains and food webs in all the seas and oceans. So if we increase their numbers in biomass, we could expect that the other compartments of the food chain would react to the change. And that is what happens. When phytoplankton increase in their numbers, zooplankton start eating them, use their energy, biomass, release carbon dioxide. Then fish eat zooplankton, use their biomass, energy, release carbon dioxide. And this is called the respiration of the system. And this is how the natural living carbon cycle works. It only cycles carbon between the atmosphere and the surface of the ocean, and very little of this carbon eventually reaches the ocean seafloor, and that is why iron fertilization will not work. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about a new strategy that perhaps begins with iron, but is not iron fertilization and is not meant to induce phytoplankton blooms. Because if we fertilize the oceans with iron for the purpose of inducing phytoplankton blooms, these blooms will reach a state of equilibrium in which they will sequester as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as they will release back as a consequence of respiration of the system, and none of this carbon will reach the ocean seafloor. What I propose to do is to seed the oceans in a totally different way with small amounts of specific forms of iron only to trigger the elevated release of extracellular organic compounds by the existing uh, phytoplankton community, which will induce the formation of marine snow. And marine snow will remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and safely and rapidly remove it from the living carbon cycle and sink it down into the Earth's geological cycle, never to return it back. And that's why I know you will want to hear the rest of my presentation. Marine snow are ubiquitous particles in all the seas and oceans worldwide. They have been described as the major pathway of organic matter from the ocean surface to the ocean interior. And they appear in various sizes, various shapes, various forms, various amounts in different regions depending on local conditions. But they all have one unique characteristic. These particles can control their own buoyancy. And if their buoyancy is disturbed by vertical mixing or strong storms, these particles will start sinking. And if they are not heavy enough, they will be retained by the picnic line in the ocean, as you can see on this picture, where they will re-aggregate, regain their buoyancy, and rise back into the water column above. And it is not only that we can see how these aggregates are getting bigger, we can measure how they're getting bigger. We discovered that marine snow consists of two parts, separate parts. The outer, whitish in color, thin, well-oxygenated layer, and the inner part, which is almost black and totally anoxic, which comprises most of the mass of the particle. And that is exactly where these aggregates gain in their weight. We also sampled the surrounding seawater around these aggregates to compare primary productivity in conditions of an intense phytoplankton bloom, which occurred in July 1997, after the occurrence of these aggregates, to primary productivity in marine snow. And this is exactly what you would get if you would fertilize the southern oceans with iron. You would be able to induce the bloom, but the bloom would be gone in a very short period of time. As you can see, primary productivity decreased by almost two orders of magnitude within two months. And in the same time, primary productivity in marine snow continued to increase. These particles may look like slimy marine organic waste or dead stuff, but they're far from that. 
their very alive community, which consists primarily of heterotrophic bacteria and cyanobacteria, actively removes carbon dioxide and converts it into organic matter. Let me bring it real to you. Please allow me to take a moment of your time and introduce you to a friend of mine I met in the Northern Adriatic in 1997. I met him only one week after he was born. And he's had one job only, and that is to get bigger. And in one week after he was born, he already managed to remove two and a half kilograms of carbon from the atmosphere. And by the time he'll be safely buried in the sediments of the seafloor, he will have removed significant amount of carbon dioxide, never to return it back. Now, if we could replicate the conditions that occurred in the northern Adriatic in 1997, in the southern oceans, in an area of 100,000 square kilometers to a depth of 50 meters, over a time of four months, the birth of such marine snow would be responsible for the removal of upwards of 1 billion tons of carbon. At the moment, we don't know yet whether this is possible, but I have studied this extensively and I know how to make marine snow. But for you to understand how we could do that and remove 1 billion tons of carbon, I have to take you back to school and teach you a little bit of biology. Most of everything we know about photosynthesis comes from research conducted on terrestrial plants. Photosynthesis is a series of chemical reactions a plant undergoes in absorbing carbon dioxide and making organic matter. It requires that the cells are exposed to the light. As part of their photosynthetic reactions, the plants do this thing called calvin benson cycle. They have all the machinery they need to harvest the energy from the sun to get enough water to produce oxygen and energy required for absorbing carbon dioxide and making organic matter. They don't need anything else. They don't need to be in any symbiotic relationship with any other organism on this planet. And many thought that the same rules apply for marine phytoplankton. I have discovered that this is not the case. I have discovered that phytoplankton actively release their intermediate metabolites, which are then absorbed by heterotrophic bacteria, which then subsequently release their own intermediate metabolites, which are then taken back by phytoplankton to complete the cycle. And if this symbiotic friendship is disturbed in any way, such as mixing, turbulence, or nutrient limitation, the cells will start releasing more and more and more of this newly produced organic matter. I measured that the cells can release up to three orders of magnitude more organic matter than they store in their cells. And they can do it only on up to a certain limit until they have enough energy to do that. And if they overshoot this limit, they simply turn on their apoptotic system, program cell death, and they commit suicide. They kill themselves. And when the cells die, their frustules explode and intracellular material is released into the ambient water. And then combined with shear, with marine debris, with the existing dissolved organic compounds, we get the sticky organic matrix of marine snow. And these newly formed particles are actively colonized by heterotrophic bacteria and cyanobacteria. Let me show you how it looks under the microscope. Being so sticky, they will stick to them everything they encounter along their way. So here you can see live phytoplankton cells attached to the sticky surface of the aggregates. We can see cyanobacteria already embedded in the matrix of marine snow, but we cannot see heterotrophic bacteria because they unfortunately don't exhibit out of fluorescence. They don't have pigments. But we can see them under a transmission electron microscope. And it was found that heterotrophic bacteria within the matrix of marine snow produce transparent polymer fibrils with which they anchor themselves to particles in marine snow because they don't want to get away. They have everything they need in abundance in their surroundings. And this was published by Andy Heisenberger and Gary Lappert in 1996. Also, in conjunction with the activity of cyanobacteria in marine snow, these two groups of organisms in this oxygenated layer 
produce a group of compounds called chemosensitizers of the multi-xenobiotic resistance. These compounds can block the functioning of detoxification mechanism in higher organisms. And we also find these compounds in marine sponges. So if an organism wants to eat marine snow, the compounds in this oxygenated layer will first block the detoxification of, of his body. And if he continues eating the interior of the aggregate, a surprise is waiting for them. Because bacteria and cyanobacteria in this anoxic conditions produce toxins which can kill the organism. And this is why no living organism in, in the sea has marine snow on their diet. And this is a guarantee that all this sequestered carbon as part of the carbon-based structure of marine snow will not enter any food chains and food webs in the seas and oceans. But when the particle is heavy enough, it will simply sink, pass through the picnic line and remove all this carbon out of the living carbon cycle. So here we have a machine. We could say that we have the real natural biological pump, which removes carbon dioxide, converts it into organic matter, builds carbon-based structure, and removes it into the geological uh, cycle of the deep seas. And now you must be wondering, do I really know how to make such marine snow? The answer is yes, in the laboratory. Let me just briefly introduce you uh, what I have developed over the time. I proved several concepts. First, that different species of phytoplankton in different communities immediately react to the addition of these specific forms of iron. Then, that they actively can grow on this form of iron. And then, that by achieving different concentrations, we can control the duration of the process. And, if we achieve suboptimal concentrations, we get marine snow. And this marine snow we get in the laboratory has exactly the same characteristics as the natural marine snow uh, we observed in the northern Adriatic Sea. So let me summarize. Everything we've done so far doesn't help. Concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere keep on rising. I've shown you the mechanism with which we can safely remove significant amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere without negative consequences to natural systems. The methodology is based on seeding the oceans with small amounts of very specific forms of iron to achieve suboptimal concentrations which will not allow the formation of phytoplankton blooms, but rather only to trigger the elevated release of extracellular compounds by the existing phytoplankton community which will initiate the formation of marine snow. And then we just have to leave it to the nature. Marine snow will do the job for us. And when they're done, sequestering carbon, converting it into organic matter, they will simply, rapidly, remove it from the living carbon cycle and sink it down into the Earth's geological carbon cycle, never to return it back. So with everything I've said so far, I hope I've been able to convince you that my idea is worth of taking into consideration and that it deserves a chance to earn your trust. Thank you very much.